Please listen carefully. Yeah, so I come wearing many hats. I have a day job at the city of Durham, North Carolina, where I work in the budget office there, and I end up doing a lot of our engagement presentations. So normally when I'm on a stage, we don't have lights this bright, but I'm talking about budgets and fund balance and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so I'll spare you guys that talk. Um, I'm here today, uh, like, like she mentioned, as a representative of Engaging Local Government Leaders, ELGL, and we um, are a big tent professional uh, association for people interested in the public sector. Um, and I'm, my title of my talk is uh, For the Love of Local Government, but I really want to convince you um, that local government is a place for these five things. A place to be creative, a place for big ideas, a place to have a seat at the table or bring people to the table, uh, a place to create better places, and a place to make a difference. Um, we believe that at ELGL, I believe that as someone that works in local government, and hopefully I can get you on my side too. So a quick, quick pitch about ELGL, just to give you a little background. Um, like I mentioned, we're a big tent professional uh, association. Our members run the gamut from graduate students in, in public administration programs to city managers and elected officials. Um, it's anybody and everybody. Um, often, local government gets siloed into parks and rec and water and streets, um, and we're trying to break that down and get everybody kind of under the same roof. Um, and I think this, uh, these are our values, and I think one of the big ones that separates us is joy, and really like how we take all of these things and, and put them together is, and if I were to summarize it in one line, uh, we're trying to humanize local government. So instead of just being a faceless bureaucrat or the person that you pay your bill to, um, we, want, we want to show you the people behind and the stories and the great work uh, going on in local government. So how does ELGL do that? And I'll, I'll be brief with these, don't worry, because I want to spend some time on, on some actual stories from some of our, our members and cities. Mostly we get together and we take selfies. Um, <laughs> so we do a, a, we've done it for two years in a row now. We have a city hall selfie day on August 15th. I hope you guys will participate next year. Um, and these are, are actually some of our winners. I don't know if you can see it from, from the crowd. Uh, but we had tons of entries, and it's just people that work in local government or people that love their city, that are celebrating their city, um, and going in front of city halls and, and libraries and parks and rec buildings and, and taking, a, taking a fun selfie. Um, this one is my favorite, although it's a close second with the, with the horse in the upper right. Um, but down here in the lower left is um, the village of Carroll Stream, Illinois. <laughs> they have uh, cutouts of their village manager, um, so they're standing behind him. And then up here, uh, the horse is Mr. Fuzzy Britches, and he's from Ocean City, Maryland. Um, <laughs> uh, this is Sarasota, uh, Florida. Um, Parks and Rec staff uh, from Milford, Delaware, and then uh, someone, a group that I can uh, really get behind, uh, the budget staff at the city of Long Beach here in the middle, uh, on their way to a retreat uh, or a, a hearing. So. Um, uh, one, one other thing, just a quick pitch uh, for ELGL, we, we do uh, um, annual conferences. Uh, last year we were in Detroit, learned a lot about how far that city has come and what they're still working on. And then we also do pop-ups in the fall. We actually had ours about two weeks ago, um, so I was knee-deep in that, uh, where we do a bunch of conferences on one day. And then, uh, like that was mentioned before, I host, uh, I produce and co-host a uh, a podcast about local government. Um, so gov love, and I, I will, uh, since I'm the producer, uh, I, I will plug it a couple more times as I'm telling some stories. So I want to spend most of my time, uh, again, talking about why I think local government is a place for those five things I mentioned, and, and kind of tell you some stories from our members and from uh, organizations that we think are doing a great, great work. Um, so the first one, uh, often uh, local government there's a lot of behind the scenes work that gets done. And one of the biggest things that local governments do um, that impacts literally everyone is they provide water service. Um, but often you can forget about it, right? As long as the tap's running, as long as uh, it comes on, you get hot water, uh, it doesn't matter, or you don't think much about it. And our friends at DC Water, um, they are trying to find a way to be creative, to get people engaged, to get people thinking about their, their water service, and, and really to get people to take pride in it. And one of the like, interesting things that I, that I think they're doing is they have a couple of big CIP projects to clean up the, the rivers around DC. So I think it's the Anacosta and the, the Potomac. Um, and they have a couple of skimmers here that are gonna clean, 
to clean the rivers and go around and, and kind of do some work. Um, and to kind of get some people interested, to get residents interested, they had an, uh, a naming contest. <laughs> so they, they posted this on social media. Um, they did a, a formal bon, bon voyage ceremony once it was chosen. Uh, but the residents of DC actually named these, uh, these little ships. And they did the same thing. Um, this is kind of harder to see, but uh, they, ha they had to dig gigantic tunnels under the city f for uh, storm and sewer water. Um, and so they had to get these tunnel boring machines. And so what they did to kind of keep people engaged with this very invisible project was they created Twitter accounts for each tunnel boring machine and they tweeted progress like, hey, I'm 1,500 feet under you right now. Um, <laughs> which I thought was uh, so fun. Um, and so they've got, uh, like they, they named those ones as well and did, and did the same thing with the Bon Voyage ceremony but underground. Um, so that, this one made it, it's a ladybird tunnel boring machine, great name. Um, <laughs> this one made it uh, 24,000 feet and uh, had a bunch of followers and a bunch of tweets uh, marking its progress. So I thought that was really creative. Um, again, an example, if you want to learn more about it, we have an episode with their uh, CEO called Waterwise and with George Hawkins. Um, so another one, uh, big ideas. So one of the big ideas that I learned about uh, recently that I really think is cool in local government is the city of Phoenix is trying to get to zero waste by 2050. And I don't know about you, but Phoenix doesn't often come to the front of mind when you're thinking about sustainability or really green places. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, okay. But uh, Phoenix isn't really there for me. So th I thought this was such an aggressive and great goal. So getting to zero waste by 2050, and that means nothing gets sent to the landfill for them. Um, and they're, they're really being aggressive with it. They're trying to get to, I think it's 40% by the end of, uh, uh, by 2020, um, which, is, which is also a big goal. And there's a bunch of different ways that they're doing this. So the big way is they're engaging with re uh, residents of Phoenix and educating them and doing outreach around like, how do we make, um, how do we make a, a waste a little bit easier to get rid of, a little easier to sort. And they're explaining their services they already have. They're also a really cool program where they brought, they're bringing startups and entrepreneurs into uh, the solid waste facilities and giving them access to the trash to figure out what they can do with it. So trying to make business out of, out of trash. Um, something that, you know, I think there's a saying like, you know, someone, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Well, that, they're trying to take that and do that in local government. And then uh, they have something called the, camp, the Resource Innovation Campus, which is my favorite euphemism. That is their landfill. Um, so they <laughs> they're bringing people in and they're and they're trying to give people access to to the trash access to their process um, to figure out the best way to you know separate things and figure out the best way to eliminate waste. And we interviewed their uh, their um, public works director who is in charge of solid waste um, in an episode. She's awesome. Um, she's one of the the few uh, African American females that, that leads the department, uh, and and so she talked a little bit about that, that that experience as well as how they're trying to diversify um, and bring more women into a, a solid waste field that, that is often dominated by men. Um, a seat at the table. So in Hamilton County, Ohio, um, at the last I mean, uh, like local election, it had been 25 years since a woman had held uh, a commissioner's office there. Um, and so uh, Commissioner Denise uh, Driehaus was elected, and it, like I said, it had been 25 years, and she, she wanted to change that. Um, so in response, she created a Women and Girls Council. And I don't know about you guys, I, I wrote about this in the little uh, write-up packet that I think everybody gets, but there, every city, every local government has a, a bunch of uh, um, citizen resident uh, committees, their boards and commissions. And they're not very popular. <laughs> so often they cover very mundane things like, you know, they review plans, they, they talk about historic preservation, um, there's a, sometimes a budget one, sometimes a parks and rec advisory board. Um, but they're very, they can be very dry. And so you don't, uh, often cities have trouble filling um, committees like this. Well, when they created this committee, a Women and Girls Council, to bring more women, more uh, young women into local government, they had an overwhelming response. Um, so it was a great way to, to create a seat at the table and bring more uh, people into, into uh, leadership and into the local government there. I want to read a quick quote uh, from the commissioner about this. Um, the council is about promoting women and girls. However, they, they also want to empower girls uh, to view themselves as leaders in the business community and in elected office. So it's, it's not just like, um, you know, being like, hey, you're doing a great job, but also getting them to be the leaders. Um, so they had a huge turnout, really successful, and it's something that I hope uh, other places look into because they, they did a great job of engaging that. 
Um, and so, like, like before, there's a, an episode where we uh, interviewed uh, Commissioner Denise Driehaus, and, and she did a really great job explaining that, and also talking about her path into public, uh, public service and, and some of the work that she's done, not only at the, the county level, but at the state as well. Um, so better places. Um, often, I think, uh, residents don't realize, or, or people that, when they live in their cities, that local governments create those places. Um, through plans, through, uh, through engagement, um, everything down from like, what, what does the, the community center look like to what, is, what, what kind of height is allowed on Main Street of buildings. And that's all done through the work of planners. Um, so one thing that I, I, I think is, one department that I think is doing great work is in the city of New York City, their housing preservation and de um, development department, they're doing um, some creative engagement to help find better ways uh, to bring residents into the planning process. So they're doing uh, engagement where um, it's actually led by the community. Um, so rather than me coming and, and talking to a mic and you t asking questions and me marking, marking things down on paper, they have a community leader lead it, um, lead the session. Give, they give them some talking points and some things they want to cover, but they, they have them lead it. That way you feel more trusted about you know, that this is a, an actual process for me and not just something coming from the city. Um, and it brings more people to the table. They feel more comfortable. They get better input. And so with that better input, you create better communities. Um, and so that's what they're trying to do. And another thing um, that, that's going on with the, um, it's the American Planning Association's New York chapter, is they're doing a lot of work around, you know, what does it take to make the planning profession more diverse? Uh, it's often dominated by, by guys, that, people that look a lot like me, um, rather than the, it doesn't look like the communities that they're actually planning for. Um, so uh, there's some a great, so I interviewed uh, Giovanna T.R. Christie. She talked a lot about her research into this, um, into like what it takes, what are the barriers, not only to recruitment, but to retention and keeping people in those jobs. Um, and it's everything from, you, you can't just expect diversity to come to you, you have to go out and get it. You have to create paid internships. You have to um, recruit at a young level, uh, at a young age. And if you can't find people that are qualified, that are diverse, then you have to create opportunities for them to get the experience that makes them qualified. So if, if you take it seriously, you have to do those kind of things. Um, and she talks like a, way, a lot more about it and a, a lot better than I, than I do. So definitely check that out if you're interested. There's a lot of lessons I think that could be applied to any sector. So uh, it's worth checking out. And then my last one here, um, this is a really heartwarming story, I thought. Um, so one of our uh, ELGL members, um, and they're actually his, the county that he's at now is now an, an organizational member, but uh, in Pasco County, Florida. So Florida was hit by Hurricane Irma a couple of weeks ago, and Pasco County is uh, north of Tampa. Um, so they didn't get the worst of it, but they didn't know that as they were preparing. Um, so that, uh, the preparation, I think, I think in the news and on the radio, you hear a lot about you know, the federal response to emergencies and disasters, but often a lot of the actual work gets done at the local level. It gets done by your, your county, by your city. And so uh, Dan uh, Biles, who's the county manager of Pasco County, Florida, um, I talked with him about you know, what that takes. And so he talked about you know, the preparation starts two to three weeks in advance. They have no idea what's coming. They have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And, and his little uh, quote to me was, but hope is not a strategy. Um, <laughs> and so they ended up, um, they ended up uh, Pasco County, like I said, didn't get hit as bad as like the Keys or anything, but they still had to shelter over 24,000 people and 1,800 pets. And, and I have to say, the pets also include a pot billy pig, so I don't know how you make that work in a school, but, <laughs> but that, that was in there. And uh, it, so it was just really inspiring to hear his perspective on that. And it was because uh, he really felt it makes a difference in the community when you can provide that support. And, and for him, you know, it's the stuff like that, responding to a disaster, that's the reason that we do what we do. That's why you're in public service. That's why you're in local government. Um, and he, um, this is an, another quote I want to read because I, I thought this is really good. You know, this is what we signed up for. No other level of government can touch people the way that we do. That's local government taking uh, care of the people in our community. Um, and so that was really inspiring to hear uh, from him. And here's a picture. It's, it's kind of hard to tell, but this top one is of their response center. So they have, they're in there 24, uh, it was, I think in the, the heat of the storm, about 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, through both the, as the storm is coming, as they're preparing, and then afterwards. And this is one of their shelters, uh, like I said, where they housed a bunch of residents. And they ended up getting a lot of people that came from the southern part of the state that they were looking for shelter in their area because the storm shifted at that kind of last minute. 
Um, but one other thing I wanted to add on their kind of uh, communication center is they did a great job like allowing the media in, allowing the public in. So they got uh, messages out as quickly and as best as they could. So they were really trying to make a difference and be uh, crystal clear in their communication. And you can check that out. Um, that's one of our more recent episodes with Dan Biles, um, who's the county manager of Pasco County, Florida. And, and that's it for me. I hope you take a little bit of a different look at your local government and, and consider getting involved or, or, uh, or making a difference in your community that way. So thank you.